going here. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul is chronological study of his life and teachings. We are in, uh, and as Belinda works her way down through the, uh, the uh, slides and he gets to the third missionary journeys, the Apostle Paul, uh, here we are, third and fourth missionary journeys. The Apostle Paul is still kind of hung out at Ephesus right now. As he prepares to leave Ephesus, he writes uh, his, what we call the first letter to the church of Corinthians, but really it's probably his second letter to that church. Uh, he's had communication with them. There's been some back and forth going on. Um, <clears throat> there's been uh, statements made, people bringing him reports. And, um, and there's been, a, a, apparently, we, we read earlier, there was a letter written, and Paul did some things in that letter. You know, this is a very corrective, in many cases, reproving and rebuking letter. He does instruct. And, you know, but I'm telling you, he, he gets pretty, he, uh, uh, he rebukes, and he rebukes sternly. He reproves, which is, the reproof is not nearly as strong as a rebuke. Rebuke is just, I mean, lay it on you, all right? A man should have his father's wife. I mean, that was a rebuke. That whole thing was a rebuke. Uh, but other places like we get into tonight, we'll get into tonight um, are a reproof of, of their actions, but not, not nearly as, as uh, caustic as he was with the, the uh, stepmama thing, okay? Hallelujah. So, <laughs> and you wonder why. All right, last week we finished up with women. Hallelujah. We're not done with women. It's just we finished up with covering that part. Hallelujah. Uh, so we got down here to verse 16, and he says, neither the churches of God. And moving to verse 17, now in this I declare unto you, I pray, now in this that I declare unto you. Now, in other words, he's about to start talking, and he changes gears here. He moves from the woman question. Remember, uh, starting in about verse, chapter 6, verse 21, Paul begins to answer questions that apparently came in a letter form from the church at Corinth over to him, and he begins to deal. He dealt with uh, food offered to idols. He's dealt with um, um, church ordinances. He's dealt with, last week, forget me to get into it. He's dealt with marriage and virgins. He's dealt with women in the church. Uh, this is church ordinances, how women ought to conduct themselves in the church, particularly wives, um, and, and honor the Lord and at the same time honor, honor the husbands. So he dealt with that. Now we get into verse 17. He says, now in this, in what, about what he's about to cover, that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better but for the worse. And so now he's coming. He's going to deal with what we refer to uh, as the Lord's table. The, you know, um, liturgical churches refer to it as the Holy Eucharist. Uh, the Lord's Table, communion, we're all talking about the same thing, okay? Uh, different terminologies within the church body do not change what we're talking about, okay? The Holy Eucharist, communion, the Lord's Table is all in reference to the ordinance established of, uh, of taking bread and, and wine and eating and drinking those in remembrance of the Lord, representing, representative of the Lord's body and his blood. Hallelujah. First of all, verse 18, when you come together in the church, I hear that there is divisions or schisms uh, among you, and I partly believe it. In other words, you know, Paul did write to the church at Rome, and when, uh, later on he says that, you know, that, uh, not, I mean, I'm sorry, to, to the church at, well, actually later in this book, I'm sorry, I don't know how I got off into Rome. He, he writes later in this book, you know, that love is ever ready to believe the best of every person. So he partly believes it. <laughs> Meaning he, he, probably, he thinks he's, this is probably an inaccurate account of what's going on. There are divisions within the church. Uh, there are cliques. Now, we would say cliques. Today. We don't use divisions nearly as much. We use cliques. There are cl now, listen, we've had it in our church. We've had cliques. You know, this group and that group. And this group was, you know, uh, left this group out. And this group didn't have anything to do with that group. And all these different things that go on in the church that should not go on in the church. Amen? But it's... it's it is human nature to gravitate to those you have a lot in common with. Let's face it. Amen? Now, um, if you come in and you're a Duke Blue Devil fan, you instantly have two friends in our church, Cap and Larry. All the others have had enough sense to shut up and be hidden. Just... Just teasing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, you know, you come in, and, you know, you got the video game, video game crowd. You got the, you know, the techie crowd. You got the, you know, um, cooking crowd. You, whatever, whatever it is, people tend, tend or you got the homeschool groups. You know, they, all the homeschoolers hang out together. All the non-homeschoolers don't hang out with the, not with the homeschoolers because, you know, they all think each other's weird and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, it's, it's just what happens. 
in churches if we don't foster developing relationships across com comfort zones. Okay? And so Paul says here, he says, I, you know, when you guys get together, you know, I, I've heard there are divisions or, or cliques among you, and I partly believe it, for there must also be heresies, uh, uh, you, know, he, he's, you know, sex or heresies, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Now, see, so you're, you're going to have, um, you have people in churches that get together who disagree with everything that the pastor does. You know, particularly in your denominational churches, they'll get in there, they'll start uprisings. How many of you have ever been in the denominational church or been part of a church split or been there when a church split took place? I have. It's ugly. Church splits are ugly. And you got these little groups to get together. And I remember in our, our church that um, uh, I was in before I went to Rainbow, and we had, and, and, and later, you know, we, we still honor and respect uh, the pastor there. He's, he's not pastor anymore. He's retired. But we still love him, appreciate him. He, married, he, he performed Jane and I's wedding. Um, but after I, after I come back from him, and the Lord led us to a different place. We didn't lead, split the church up. We didn't, you know, just let the Lord let us here, you know, um, to, to a word of faith church. And, and I'll be honest with you, my, my particular denomination had sent out a letter uh, right after I got back from him saying that, you know, not, don't let people preach Copeland or Hagen in your churches. Now, in other words, preach the word of faith, you know. Well, that's kind of hard. I just graduated from Ramah. <laughs> kind, of, kind of hard to stay under, under those kind of guidelines when you just, you just graduated from Hagen's Bible School. You know, and, um, and a pastor friend of mine, ours had just come back the year before I did, who had been with the denomination for 34 years, missionary to a foreign country in Central America uh, for, for, for a couple of decades, um, well-respected. They would not give him a church when he came back from Ramah. He had to go start his own, end. They, they refused to allow him to have a church. So um, we didn't, we kind of, it's kind of a situation where you, you weren't able to stay even if you had wanted to. They, they wouldn't let you. And, uh, but the pastor's a good man. And uh, we, we still love our roots and, and our, you know, the, the, what we came up under. They've changed over the years and gotten more open and receptive, uh, so much so that that denomination has got a, a um, satellite Bible school in conjunction with Rhema Bible Training Center on the campus of Rhema. And the same denomination where the, my, our conference is, don't let them preach Hagen and Copeland, now has a, bio, has a satellite school using the Rhema facilities and accepting uh, the credits from Rhema as part of their credits. So God does stuff in 30 years. <laughs> amen? I said amen? Hallelujah. But here, you know, you're going to have sex. In this particular case, he said heresies among you, that they which are approved may, 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 may be made manifest. Well, that was a tongue twister for me. May be made manifest among you. Sometimes you got, you know, when, when things are out of hand, those who are walking in the light come to the top because they, they walk in the light, and they walk in the truth, and they're able to share the truth, and people are able to see the truth and the light when it's ministered, okay? And then when you come together in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. That was supposed to be, but that's not what they were coming for, okay? For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. Now, what's wrong if you go ahead and get in line first? And get, well, if we go over here, I, I always call pastoral, you know, privileges when we have fellowships. Now, maybe I shouldn't, but I just do. All right? And I go get in front of the, front of the line. Now, maybe I should wait till last. Do y'all want me to start waiting till last? I'll start waiting till last. Not. All right. Anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've preached. I'm tired. I'm ready to eat. All right? Hallelujah. <clears throat> Actually, one of the reasons we like to go first is so we can go ahead and eat and then get up and fellowship with people as they're sitting and talking. That, that way we can kind of get our meal out of the way and then go fellowship with everybody. All right? Hallelujah. But um, here, you know, it's not that it was getting something before someone else got it was wrong. It was that they weren't walking in love. You see, their, their, their lack of the love walk and understanding. If this is the Lord's table, it is a table of loving and caring and having compassion one another. This is not a fill your belly thing. All right? And that's what had started happening. Instead of them coming together and breaking bread and, ce and celebrating the, the, the communion table, the Lord's table, the Holy Eucharist, they had come and began just to pig out and to eat and to drink and all this kind of stuff and were not walking in accordance with the very one that they represent, were supposed to be honoring at this table. All right? And so what? Have you not houses to eat and drink in or despise you the church of God and shame them that have not? Um, or are poor. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. And I love the way Paul does that. 
you know. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you that the same night that Je and the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now remember, he is reproving them for not really honoring what this table was all about. Not as much as they got mine first. See, if the table is about the Lord, then their conduct should represent the Lord. Amen. That they should conduct themselves in a way that honors the Lord. And that is preferring your brother above yourself. Laying down your life for your friend. Just because you rich and can bring a bunch of stuff to, the, to, the, to, to this doesn't mean you get this, to tell a poor person to sit in the corner. I don't have time for you. Now, they, they totally were misunderstanding what this was all about. They were making it a feast to eat instead of a honoring and celebration of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so they had totally misinterpreted the purpose, and that's why Paul's upset. He said when the Lord Jesus, uh, and when she was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat, this is my body. Now remember, how many, how many know it's not really easy to break loaf bread? You tear it, but you don't really break it. Break crackers. And really the kind of bread, what they were unleavened bread, really is like a cracker. Um, and we've talked about this before when we take a communion, but we'll just do it here. It, 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 was, it was flat loaves or, or flat bread with piercings in it because unleavened bread doesn't rise and won't cook properly unless you pierce it so the heat can rise to the different places. And so they would pierce it. Well, and the very nature of unleavened bread is it cooks unevenly as far as darkness. You know, you basically end up with stripes on it, just like a cracker. I mean, and it's a cracker. It's lighter gold, like a golden light brown here, but maybe a darker brown over here, and, and in almost stripe form based on what part rose up and got nearer to the heat, Okay. And so they're using, you know, either round, flat pieces of unleavened bread. They're all pierced. They're uneven cooked, so there's stripes on it. There's piercings in it. And uh, Jesus broke it. Now, if you've, how many of you have ever been to Europe? All right. How many of you have ever eaten breads in Europe? Hard as a brick. I mean, first, when we, that first time we went, the first week we were there, our mouths got raw on the top from eating the bread because it was so hard. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I mean, you start eating, I mean, it's good, but you start eating, it just rubs your, your, the top of your mouth raw. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, those hot dogs at the Eiffel Tower, oh, glory. I mean, you take a hot, you take a piece of a, a baguette and you shove it down that, they had, they had a cylinder just set they shove it down and put a hole in and they take a foot long hot dog and they just cram it down in there. And, uh, oh, man. Anyway. That was a Bill Clinton invitation. I don't know why I'd use Bill Clinton tonight, but maybe he likes hot dogs in Paris. I don't know. Amen. And, uh, but, you know, the bread was really hard. And so Jesus would, could break this bread because it was hard. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, and do this in remembrance of me. Now, Paul is saying that the purpose of you coming together, he said, the, it's the same thing that Jesus said when he was betrayed. He said, take the bread and break it, and as you eat it, remember me. Okay? Now, here we have the symbolisms. Uh, recognized here. The unleavened bread, having to be pierced, is just like where he says in the, uh, the 22nd Psalm, they, they gazed on me or looked upon him whom they pierced. Okay? Now, this was about uh, 1,500 years before Roman crucifixion became a form of capital punishment when the prophet said they looked on him whom they pierced. And uh, so Jesus said, this bread is a representation of my body. He was pierced. And then we know from 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes, we were healed. He said the unleavened bread represented his body. His body was pierced when he hung on the cross. And the stripes he bore on his back brought us a healing from diseases. Glory to God. Amen. And so to not recognize that, just to eat and to get drunk and to get your belly full, was, was Paul was reproving because that, it, we, he didn't want them to miss what was going on in the church? That's what we said earlier. What don't you have some place? Don't you have a house house to eat in? If you got to be if you got to be a pig or gluttonous, you got to get you can get your belly full. Eat before you come. That's not the purpose of what we're doing here. It's not wrong to eat. Now listen. Now somebody take what I say. They're around. Oh, Pastor Red said you can't have fellowships at the church. We're the number one fellowship church. We believe in eating at church. Just not like they were doing here, and not in under the pretense that it's the Lord's table. That's the big thing. And after the same manner also, he took the cup. Now, now if you go back and study a little uh, Judaism, um, the Passover, they may understand that the Lord's table, we refer to the Lord's table, Holy Communion, Holy Eucharist, 
Can I just cut the Lord's table communion? We don't have to keep going to the Eucharist thing. I just want anybody watching that and know we understand that we're talking about the same thing. <clears throat> Whether in a liturgical church you're calling it Eucharist or in a, in a denominational church you're calling it communion or in independent churches, a lot of times call it the Lord's table. Um, we're all referring to this event. And this, this particular meal came as Jesus and the disciples were celebrating Passover. And so the roots of the Lord's table and understand, these are still covenant meals. The, the Passover meal was a covenant meal. Amen. Remember, they put the blood on the doorpost and on the lentils. And they, and they went in and ate, ate the lamb and ate the bread and in preparation for a journey. Remember? Okay. So, was, you know, um, they had the blood over them and the lamb in them. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But this, this meal was celebrated at what was referred to as Passover which is when, when all the Jews were to bring their, 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 their annual sacrifices to Jerusalem for the priests to sacrifice for the sins of the nation. And, um, you know, uh, John the Baptist had referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God, which is slain from the foundation of the world, that Jesus was crucified during Passover and raised from the dead you know, on what we now call the Lord's Day or Sunday. Really, it was the first day of the week. Saturday was the end of the week, okay? And Jesus was crucified uh, during Passover. As, and, and the high priest had him sit to the cross, fulfilling the last duty of the priesthood. That last duty of the high priest was to, to uh, offer Jesus. There's been no need for any sacrifice since. Glory to God. Because he, he was entering once and for all for the sins of us all. Amen. But in, in preparation of this, just as the Jews did for the preparation of the exodus of, of Egypt, they had a meal. And it was a covenant meal. Passover meal was a covenant meal with God Almighty. You know, when they, when they took that, they were in preparation for God to deliver them from Egypt. And so the, the bread and the wine, they were to eat unleavened bread. And they weren't to have any, you know, they weren't to have the yeast in it and that kind of thing. Um, so they, they unleavened bread. And same thing when Jesus, when the Passover was taken with Jesus, it was unleavened bread. Hallelujah. And it was all about not being, it was all representing being in a haste for a journey. You know, because they were getting ready to leave in a hurry. And um, Jesus came, and so what they would do, they would serve that, and, and traditionally, and they, now not the first night, but over time, they served, they began to serve that, and, um, and they would have this, this pouch. They had three compartments, basically, and uh, if you ask a Jew what those meant, they, rep they represent Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had the three pouches, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They always serve Isaac first, and they don't know why. They pull from the center pouch and serve Isaac. Of course, we know Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Jesus took that bread and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Okay? So in tradition, they, 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 they say it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and serve Isaac, not knowing why, because we understand in New Testament light, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Son was served. Amen? Then it says he took the, the cup. When he had supped, he took the cup, not a cup. No, he did not take a cup. He took the cup. In, in um, the Passover meal, the Jews have a chalice that is sitting empty. In their, in their meal, that, when, that they believe that Messiah will come. Messiah will come in, he'll turn the cup up, and declare he's Messiah. Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Hallelujah. And so he, he, he declared his Messiahship, that he was the Christ. Christ and Messiah are the, are the same meaning words. In other words, Christ, Christos, is the, um, is the Greek equivalent to Hamashiach. Messiah of the Old Testament. You know, uh, Jesus' name would actually be Yeshua HaMashiach, and, and in Greek, you know, the Greek and then the English transliteration, Jesus Christ. Okay? All right, so they were waiting for Messiah or Christ to come. He took the cup and said, this cup is the New Testament or New Covenant, Testament and Covenant. In my blood, this do you as often as you drink in remembrance of me. So he says that the blood, remember this, the, old, uh, the, the scripture teaches us that, all, that, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. That when they, when they finished getting all the law of God, it was sprinkled with blood and hyssop, okay, and, and to seal the covenant in blood. That when they were to leave Egypt, the blood was put on, the, and I always love this allegory, because, you know, they put the blood on the, on the, on the doorpost and on the lintel. So the doorpost on the sides and on the lintel. Well, you know, it was runny, so it would drip. So we have, if you drew lines between the, the, the doorpost, side to side, and from the lintel to the ground, you had a cross. Okay? They had to go through the blood. They had to go through the cross. 
tuned into the covenant. Glory to God. Amen? Hallelujah. <clears throat> and so, all the symbolism here, Jesus' blood is being shed to seal the covenant. Amen? And he went on and said this, and Paul says this, Now, as far as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till they come. In other words, now here we have a covenant meal that declares that Jesus was, was crucified and bore our sins and that he's coming again. You do show the Lord's death until he come. So that meal represents the past and the future. We stand in between it, and we stand in between the old covenant and the passing of the priesthood and the, and the fulfillment of the coming of the, of the Messiah's kingdom. In its fullness, we stand in a blood covenant between the two with God Almighty through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. And so this is why Paul's upset. You don't understand what you're doing here. You're coming here and just getting full. You're, getting, you're drinking too much, even getting drunk. I mean, he gets ticked off at him because you've missed the whole point of why you're here. Corinthians, carnal. We ought to change it to the book of First Carnality. They were a carnal bunch. Amen. Therefore, and then he goes on to this next verse. Wherefore, now wait a second now. You eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, without judgment or without discernment. Okay? Doesn't mean that, you know, you're, you're, uh, you sinned this morning and you came into the table. Because we know there's forgiveness at, at the Lord. Amen? It is in reference to not having the right understanding of what you're doing. Okay? Or being uh, crass or callous about what you're doing. Somebody say glory. Okay? So to eat it and drink it unworthily, um, irreverently, without proper respect to what you're doing. Eateth and drinketh damnation, yeah, or it can be, that can be um, condemned or condemnation, what? To himself, listen to what he says, not discerning the Lord's body. There's the key. Not this table is not about fulfilling the need for food. It is not about quenching your physical thirst. This table was a memorial meal and representative of the covenant we now stand in that is that, that's sealed in the blood of Jesus, that provides health to our body through the sacrifice that was born. So we do show his death until he come. And we walk in the benefits of the new covenant he ratified and sealed with his blood. Okay? I love people say there's no, there's no condemnation to those. You know, there's no condemnation to me. Well, you know, Paul, Paul did not say that. He says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after, who, walk, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You cannot walk after the flesh. I mean, you cannot walk after the flesh and avoid condemnation, even from your own heart. All right? Paul said, he that eateth drinketh unworthy or, or irreverently. Eateth and drinketh damnation, or that word also can be translated condemnation. Oh, yeah, there it is. Or judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause. Everybody say, for this cause. What cause? Failure to rightly discern the Lord's table. He didn't even say he was committing adultery and murder. Just said not even rightly discerning the Lord's table. His body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Can I translate sleep for you? Dead. Many are dead. They did not rightly discern. Now, God didn't strike them down, but because they failed to realize and rightly discern what Jesus did for them and the price he paid for them and the blood that he shed for them and that his body bore their sickness because they didn't rightly discern that, some of them were weak, sickly, and some of them just flat out died. It wasn't, it wasn't that God, their own, they brought their own condemnation on themselves. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Now, there are a bunch that runs around and says that God doesn't judge anybody and that God doesn't condemn anybody. You know, uh, you know that there's no judgment with God. It's all love. It's all love. It's all love. Here he says that God will chasten you. He'll judge you and chasten you. So you won't end up in the condemnation of the world. 
What's the, what's the, what does the world get for its condemnation? Hell. And ultimately, the lake of fire, which is the second death. I don't believe in hell. Jesus did. Hello? Even told a, a story, not a parable, but a story about a rich, man, a, guy named, a rich man and a guy named Lazarus. And said the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, in torments. Amen. Well, that went over big. I don't believe in hell. Well, Lord help us. When we're judged, we're chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. What is what's Paul saying? He's trying to get them to understand that if you do not rightly discern what the Lord's table is all about, if you misjudge it and mis and and I want to, I'm trying to not use misuse it because I'm not sure that's the right word, but misappropriate what you're doing at the Lord's table. And in this case, they were just coming basically having feast where the rich folks were getting a lot of food and the poor folks weren't getting anything and the rich folks were getting drunk and the poor folks weren't getting anything. And, um, you know, and, and they didn't, and everybody missed the whole premise of why they came together for the Lord's table. And he's reproving them for that because if they don't write the discernment, many are weak and sick, and some of them just flat out died. They didn't rightly discern it. Then he goes on verse 33, wherefore, my brother, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. In other words, wait on each other. And if any man hunger, listen to this. We know he's talking, not talking about having meals to eat. He's not talking about the Wednesday night dinner, uh, the second Wednesday night of every month when we come together and eat before church. Everybody buys a meal, we eat spaghetti. How many enjoyed that spaghetti last week? Yeah. I enjoyed it again on, Sunday, on Saturday. Sunday, we, heat, we had leftovers. We put frozen it and heated it up. It was just as good on Sunday as it was on Wednesday. Hallelujah. But if any man hunger, let him eat at home, and when, that you come not together un, unto condemnation, and the rest I will set in order when I come. So Paul says, listen, listen. If you're hungry, eat before you come, because that's not what we're here for. This is not what this is about. It's one thing if you declare that this is a meal, everybody come by 450 and you got to get it there. It's nothing if you say we're having the Lord's table and you go over here and grab all the crackers and start cramming them in your mouth and grab the grape juice and just start sucking it down like Jeff did at the wedding. I think Jeff was high. He just went ahead and finished off with the whole chalice. I mean, I'm standing here trying to grab it from him. Okay, bro. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And so Paul, is, he brings this correction about the Lord's table. He says, now, make sure you're rightly discerning what this is all about. Don't, don't, come, into this thing, don't come into this irreverently or um, with, with a flippancy. Make sure you're honoring the Lord's table because we don't want you weak, we don't want you sick, and we don't want you dead. And we don't want you to have to get judged of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, the Lord will judge you to protect you. Did you know God's judgment is protection? People get mad when somebody says what you're doing is wrong. I'm like, come on, people. Yes, what you're doing is wrong. And what you're doing is wrong, and it's going to hurt you if you don't make corrections. Amen. Keep flirting with that woman, and you're going to end up in adultery. Stop it. Hello. Y'all hear y'all going home. Straighten up your act. Stop doing this. It's, it, it is a protective thing. Now, here, here's, what the world, here's what the world mindset is. If, if uh, you're doing something like that and, and I tell you it's wrong, uh, they, the world, worldly people come to you and say, hey, man, he, he's judgmental. You do whatever you want to do. They don't love you. I said, they don't love you. They don't care about you. They just want to be your go-to guy. They don't care about you. Because if they cared about you, they wouldn't, do, wouldn't in, in reinforce you doing things that are going to be detrimental to you in the future. I mean, I mean let's just change it this way. I'm at a bridge, and, and, and the bridge is out, and I, I get one of those, those signs that the, the road crews use. Stop! Stop! And I'm holding it up. And you come, you're coming up real fast, and the guy in the car says, oh, he's just trying to get in your way and keep you from having fun. Go on. Of course, he jumps out before you run off the bridge because the bridge is out. See, the one that cares about you is the one trying to stop you. All right? Not the one who keeps telling you, go ahead on. Go ahead on, man. Just have some fun. 
I mean, it's only 300 feet down to the bottom of the river. It'd be the best ride you ever had. And the last. <laughs> All right. Now, Paul goes on and moves on. He doesn't stop here. He goes on now, now concerning spiritual gifts. Now, what he does, he's changing gears. He's moving from the Lord's table. He said his correction here about that. You know, he says, and, and, and he'll set some more stuff in order when he gets there. So the next time he comes over, he'll, he'll have a little more deeper conversation with him about it. But here's enough of, the, uh, enough of what he needs to say to get you straightened out. Start conducting yourself in a different way. Amen. Then he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brother. Now, the word gifts is italicized in, your, in, in most Bibles. It is not in the original Greek. Actually, the word spiritual is a plural word. And it says, now concerning spirituals, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now, I've, I've heard that and read behind people who've, who've said that this word spirituals means really kind of carries the meaning of things of and pertaining to the Holy Ghost. And if we study this out, we'll find out. Now concerning things of and pertaining to the Holy Ghost, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto the, even unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Who led them? The devil, your flesh, carnality, led you to follow dumb idols. Now what kind of idols are they? Dumb. All idols are dumb. Not that they can't speak, they're dumb. They won't help you. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a cursed or anathema, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now, talking about, their, talking about out of their spirit, and, and, and you can't say that Jesus is cursed and be of God. And you can't say, now listen, we're not just talking about a head exercise, we're talking about out of your heart. The confession of lordship. You can't confess unless the Holy Ghost is, is in bearing witness with you and prompting you. Okay? You know, you, just, you can't. Um, people who don't believe that, well, not out of their heart. Oh, you mean somebody go, oh, yeah, Jesus is Lord, and they don't mean it. That's not, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the heart confessions here. So, in other words, he's saying that, that we understand what spirit's in operation by what, and really if you study this whole thing, what's being said here is, does what takes place curse Jesus or declare his lordship? What do you mean curse Jesus? Draws men unto the man. Now, I'm not talking about people who are just stupid and have man worship. You know, people get, uh, we, humans can be, well, actually they, 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 they are, some of the most interesting creatures on the planet. I don't know what to say. You know, some rock star, how many, I, mean, I'm only, I won't even name the name of the rock star, but I'm telling you, I look at it, and all the girls used to go crazy over him, and he was bony, skinny, uglier than homemade soap. And then as he got older, it got worse. Okay? Pop, all the girls just talked about how, how, how hot he was with his skinny jeans. We're talking 30 years ago wearing skinny jeans. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I don't necessarily, I'm not trying to say I'm actually going to cover GQ, but I look at this guy and go, what are you talking about? Because they were popular. And because they were popular, they man worship. Okay? They're on the platform. Pastors run into this. Ministers running this, and that's why they got to be careful to guard themselves because, you know, women come into the church, and they want to be with the pastor. He could be, uh, he could be as ugly as that rock star was. But because he's the authority, or he's the one with the, the authoritative power, they're attracted to it. Okay? All right. Why well, was I saying all that? Yep. I was talking about calling Jesus a curse out of your spirit. Yeah, man worship. I got into man worship. That's what it was. Okay. We, we know when, when things are going on, people can begin to worship man. But the truth of the matter is when, when all is said and done, was Jesus glorified or was man glorified? Now, if, now, people can glorify a man and it not be the man's fault. He could be walking with the Lord and they just act like the world. They get that world mindset. We got it going on now. You know, and it happened with Dad Hagen. It happened with Copeland. It happened with different ones. People were just crazy stupid. Amen. But you, we, we, have to, we have to honor the vessel in the proper ways, but we follow the Lord. Amen. And if the vessel gets off, we have to follow the Lord. Amen. If the vessel starts to teach you things in our Bible, we have to follow the Lord. It's because men, men are fallible. They're not infallible. They are fallible. Okay. Now, 
Paul's saying that when there's a spiritual manifestation, does it declare the lordship? I'm going to kind of just paraphrase this. Really what he's saying here is, does it declare the lordship of Jesus or does it bring it down? So, somebody says, yea, thus saith the Lord, Jesus is not the Son of God. That's not the Spirit of God. We know that. Okay? No man speaking about the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. Okay? And no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. And the evil spirit would not come in there and go, oh, yay, the Lord says that Jesus is God's Son and you need to repent and be saved. Amen? Now, they did have a spirit of divination. Remember, it said, these men of the Most High God uh, show the way of salvation, hear you them. But you notice it didn't say that Jesus is Lord. And this they did many days of Paul being grieved and the Spirit turned and said, come out. And, you know, they lost all their money and they got ticked off and arrested them. But she, she wasn't saying Jesus is Lord. She said, these men are the servants of the Most High God who show, show us the way of salvation. He couldn't say Jesus is Lord. Anyway. All right. So he goes on and says here, it's not quite time to go, is it? Hallelujah. That there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all and all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For unto one, and we'll get into, the, then we start getting into the different gifts. I got to stop here. Let's, let's kind of just stop. Next week, we'll, we'll pick up here. Notice he says there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of administrations or different ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. So we have, we have gifts, administrations, and operations, but it's all the Lord, uh, Spirit, and God all working in these things. Amen? And manifesting them in the church. So, you know, we could, we could try to get in there and be real technical about what is a diversity, of, you know, what is a gift, what is an administration, what is an operation. Just, just, we'll just flow with the Holy Ghost. Amen? Um, he's, he's saying that these different manifestations or these different actions of God um, are God. And, there's di and they're not all, and it's not always going to be the same. I've heard, I've, I used to hear Dad Hagen say, and then, and then the, uh, those, those that work closely with him, uh, Annie was one of them, uh, Durant. Um, you know, Dad would say, you know, uh, one way, not the only way, but one way to heal is through the laying on of hands. Okay? And we say it's not the only way. That's one way. There's other ways. Amen? Uh, there's, there's, um, there's anointing with oil. There's prayer of agreement. There's gifts of the Spirit where the, where the gifts of healings are in manifestation. <clears throat> there is the laying on of hands. There's prayer calls. So you say there's one. Say there's, difference. there's different ways, but the end result, the, the author and the end result are all the same. The God, God, Jesus, the Holy Ghost in operation, and the end result is the health and holiness of the person being ministered to. But, you know, there's different, different operations of that, different manifestations of that. There's even different manifestations of the gifts of healings. You might have somebody, <clears throat> now I'll be honest with you, we're beginning to find out that, that one, the, the strongest arena we have in ministry is through prayer calls. We have more notable miracles through prayer calls than we do in the church, laying hands on people. Not that we haven't had people healed by laying on hands. We have notable miracles. As we shared Sunday, Knight Janice had a friend just a few weeks ago, stage two breast cancer, took a prayer cloth, went back to the doctor's, it's, it's gone, and they don't know why. A year ago, Joe took a prayer cloth to a guy who was sent home to die. Gave him eight days to live. He's at work today, heal. Called hospice and sent him home to die. We never went and saw him. We sent a prayer cloth. Hallelujah. We've had notable. I, I prayed for candy one time. Couldn't get, they couldn't get a prayer cloth to the person. They prayed for candy and took it to this, this uh, uh, person and down in Rocky Mount. They had tuberculosis. God healed them with tuberculosis. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. So we, we, have, we, we, we operate in these, these diversities. Well, which one's better? Whichever one you get a hold of that gets you the, that gets you the result you're after. Amen. Whether you went to me, you went to him and he had hands laid on you, whether you got a prayer cloth, who cares as long as you get healed? I don't. I really don't. Man, if I get healed, I get healed. Praise God. Amen. 
Glory to God. So next week, we're going to pick up here <coughs> in this passage. We're going to get down here and, you know, get into the gifts of the Spirit. And um, praise God. Eventually, we're, going, you know, we're not that far from finishing this. This is a long book. You know, do know that this is the um, second longest book of the New Testament of Paul's writings. Romans is the longest. All right. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. So uh, let's be here. Sunday, Sunday is uh, Resurrection Day. Everybody say Resurrection Day. I know some of you won't be able to be here Sunday night, but uh, come on out Sunday morning um, and be with us. Praise the Lord. We're going to have a good time together, and uh, we're going we're to preach a resurrection service sermon. Hallelujah. I love to preach on the, um, what happened from the cross to the throne. Well, that's, a, that's a good sermon. That's just always a good sermon. Hallelujah. Where Jesus conquers the forces of darkness and comes up out of hell, victorious as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. And ascends to the throne of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. With his own blood, he enters in once. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>